Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indizar Education. Um, we continue talking about a curl of a vector field. Previous lecture was about two-dimensional curl, curl of the vector field, of two-dimensional vector field. And that's kind of easy, because if you can rem remember, we were using, let's say, this whiteboard as a, a two-dimensional surface, and we can install a tiny pedal wheel somewhere and rotation of this pedal wheel was basically a characteristic of the vector field which is defined at every point of this surface so if it turns this way it's curl um, well negative if it turns that way it's curl positive um, and basically the intensity of the spinning is a characteristic, uh, a quantitative characteristic of curl at any point wherever we put this wheel. And it was easy because it's flat surface, so there is only one orientation of the um, this uh, pedal wheel which we can arrange. Just put it in such a way that the axis of uh, rotation is perpendicular to the plane. In three-dimensional space it's kind of more difficult because no matter how we put this, it's still kind of different orientation of this wheel and uh, probably we have to put it in some way that rotation is most intensive and that would be the curl. Sounds reasonable actually. So anyway, that's what will be a subject of today's lecture. This lecture is part of the course uh, called Physics for Teens, presented on unisor.com. I suggest you to watch this lecture from this website, because it's a course on the website. Physics for Teens is a course, so there is a menu, sub-menu, etc., so everything is logically related. There are um, notes for each lecture, so not only the video presentation, but also you can just read it as a textbook parallel to the, um, to the video. There are problems, there are exams, which you can take in, in, uh, any number of times you want. And the site is totally free, no advertisement, no strings attached. Okay, so let's go back to three-dimensional curl. So first of all, we have to have a three-dimensional vector field. So this is a vector which is defined at any point with coordinates x, y, z in space. Now, every vector in three-dimensional space can be represented by its three components, which I call the x, the y, and the z. At the same time, if you have three components, we can have three unit vectors on each axis. Usually the terminology is I for X vector J along the Y axis and K along the Z axis. So we basically represent a vector, this vector, with these three components as sum of unit vectors along the axis uh, multiplied by corresponding components. This is a plain vector algebra and we are not talking about the details of this, it's supposed to be known. If it's not, there is a parallel course, prerequisite actually course, called Mass Routines on this website and there are vectors explained there. Okay. Also, the same mass routines has calculus part, where you can um, read about uh, derivatives, partial derivatives, which will be used here. Okay, so that's done. Now, now we have to place our pedal wheel at point x, y, z, and wait. After some time, it will probably uh, orient itself properly, probably 
when its uh, axis is parallel to the most important kind of direction of the ve vector field and it will turn uh, or not turn and that would characterize the curl so we'll we're waiting until it basically start spinning or not spinning um, in, a, in a stable kind of way and that would be our curl of the vector field but now we have to quantitatively evaluate it now first of all if this wheel has basically established its um, position and and speed of rotation how can we characterize the position of this wheel well if you remember some time ago when we were talking about rotation um, we characterized speed of rotation with a vector which is directed along the axis of rotation so let's say if this is speed of rotation we associated it with a vector magnitude of which is basically equal to a speed of uh, rotation and uh, the direction of this vector one or another side was such that from the top of this vector we see the rotation uh, counterclockwise. That's basically a vector. So we can characterize this, uh, the uh, spin, the rotation of this probe wheel by a vector which is along, which is directed along the axis of finally established the axis of rotation and the length, the magnitude of this vector would be equal to the speed of rotation and again direction would be in such a way that from the top of the vector you see the rotation counterclockwise. That's basically our agreement. It's convenient because one vector would be basically completely describing the rotation of this pedal wheel at any point in space. Well, let's call this vector K. And by the way, it can also be represented as any vector as a sum of its components. So it's Kx. I, I, I assume xyz in, in the parentheses. So my question right now is, basically my task is to evaluate this vector if I am given this vector. Kind of complex, but we can always try to simplify any problem by dividing it into smaller, simpler problem which we have already solved before. That's exactly how we are going to do. Think about it this way. If my vector of um, s wheel rotation, if my vector, basically it's a curl, if it's a curl vector, if my curl vector has three dimensions and my this vector has three dimensions, what I'm kind of assuming would be a natural thing to um, represent the x component of the um, curl, x component of the rotation. X component of rotation, this one, as caused by projection of the V vector, which is somewhere, let's say, projection onto the YZ plane. So again, rotation around the x-axis 
is rotation within yz plane. So I assume that it's it, it, it's a leap of faith. I mean, yes, obviously you have to really kind of understand it and, and agree, because it's my assumption, which happened to be actually corresponding to the real thing is, obviously experiments can be arranged, etc., that the uh, X component of the curl, which is rotation around the X axis, it's basically a rotation of this vector projected on yz plane. So basically I can assume that x is a constant, doesn't really matter what it is, and consider only a function of two arguments, kind of, which basically in a correct representation would be vy of xyz times j plus vz at xyz times k. So j is along the y component of vector v along the y-axis, vz is a component along the z-axis, and sum of this and this is basically a projection of home vector onto um, yz plane. So we project this to this point yz and the vector would be somehow, I don't know how, it's the end of this projection. So that would be the projection of the vector v of x, y and z in three-dimensional space onto um, uh, yz plane. And as vector v is rotating in space in different places, um, I mean the whole vector field v has certain rotation, certain curl in certain spaces, or not have, whatever it is, its projection on the yz axis would have basically some kind of a rotation which causes the x component of the rotation. This is probably the most important part of this lecture, to understand this. So again, vector in three-dimensional space, it's projected on two-dimensional space, y and z. And if there is any kind of a rotation at point x, y and z, any kind of a... if wheel would spin in this particular position, in this particular... Uh, in, in some space, then projection of this vector will also have certain wheel and the in this case, if we put this wheel onto yz, its axis would be perpendicular and it will cause basically only the, the rotation of the, um, uh, of this, uh, of the curl vector uh, around the x-axis, only the compon x component of rotation um, around the x-axis. This is the most important and that you really have to kind of feel and understand. Because after that, basically everything is easy. How easy? Well, very easy. It means that kx of x, y, z is a curl of this vector. And we have already learned from the previous lecture that rotation in the 2z, which is represented by components according to the coordinates, is the minus g v y of x y z by g z. We have already established this in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we had x and y. x doesn't really matter. In this lecture, we have right now y and z only, because we started from the x, and y and z was the plane of rotation. We will move to y and z, obviously. So, we have already determined the x component of the curl of our vector. Now, obviously, 
if I want to do this, I have to multiply it by i, and I have to multiply this. by i. And that's what this particular thing is. Absolutely similarly we have ky equals to d. Uh, so it's xz plane, right? So it's x of xyz by dz minus d z uh, d z by d x and finally k z that's the curl of projection of rotation onto x y z That's the formula which was in the previous lecture, dy of x, y, d, v, y. d, v, d, v, y of x, y, z by d, x minus d, v, x of x, y, z by d, z by dy, sorry. Basically, that's it. We finished. We have determined three components of the curl of the vector field. So the vector field has three components. We have basically considered every pair of components, which is basically a projection onto corresponding plane. So dz, dy and dz is projection onto yz plane, which causes a rotation around x. Um, x and z plane is rotation around y, and x and y uh, projection is rotation around z. That was exactly what was determined in the previous lecture. We were using x and y. The only problem which I have right now so this should be multiplied by j, and that gives me this component, and this is supposed to be multiplied by k, this is by j, and this is by k, and that gives me this component. The only problem is, it's kind of cumbersome. I mean, people, mathematicians and physics, don't like long formulas, so I would like to simplify it. And it's actually, the result is amazingly, amazingly simple. Here is the simplification of this. Let's say we have two vectors. Vector P, which can be represented as three components. Px, Py, and Pz. and vector q, which has its own three components. I would like to express in terms of px, py, pz, qx, qy, and qz, vector product of p times Q vector product, cross product. Okay? Two vectors in three dimensional space. Everything is supposed to be very simple, right? So three components times three components and multiply each by each. And uh, we'll have a result. Now, the only thing is I would like to point out that we will end up with multiplication, well, uh, constants Px q, x, q, y, p, y, etc. will be multiplication. Simple. What about the vector multiplication? Do you remember something like, um, first of all, uh, it's anti-commutative, so if you change the order, a times a 
cross uh, product B is minus B cross product A. I hope you remember that from the vector product, from the cross product. And also, uh, if you have two vectors which are perpendicular to each other, let's say A and B, the result of their um, uh, vector product is the vector perpendicular to both of them, which magnitude is equal to times this times this, um, and the direction would be uh, some kind of rule. If you will put from, if you will rotate from A to B, it would be this direction towards us from the port. So based on this, there are some rules about I and J and K multiplication. Now, multiplication of vector by itself, they are basically collinear, so sine of angle between them is zero, so that would be always zero, as well as j by j is zero, and k by k is zero. Now, as far as i times j, it would be a vector perpendicular to both. Now, this is a long x-axis, this is long y-axis, so the perpendicular to both will be z-axis and the ma magnitude would be uh, the, the product of the magnitudes, right? E each magnitude is one, it's a unit vector, so that would be k. And then j times k would be i, and uh, k times j times, times i would be j. I mean, we can always consider all the different combinations. If we want k times j, it would be minus i, etc. So using all these rules, which are quite simple, I will write the result. And if you want intermediate results, it's all written in the notes for this lecture. But anyway, the result is the result is uh, p y q z minus p z q y i plus analogous j plus analogous k and what I would like to say I don't want to spend too much time just rewriting all this the problem is that if px if, if p is a nabla nabla is deeper dx deeper dy deeper z same as the previous lecture. Three components, d per dx, d per dy, and d per dz. A triplet of operators, nabla. And q is our vector v at x, y, z, with components v, x, v, y, and z. Then this is exactly this which means that I can write a very simple expression for my vector product of nabla times v. This is exactly curl of v. So this is the simplest formula possible, and all these complication results um, results in this particular formula. Again, uh, I, I skip a couple of intermediary steps. They are absolutely trivial. I just don't, don't want to waste my time but, um, and your time. Uh, but all these intermediary results are written um, on the notes on this website, notes for this lecture. So I suggest you just to go there. Well, basically that's it. We have determined how, in a simple form, express the curl of our vector field at any point. And, um, well, you know that our, uh, m my favorite model right now of the vector field is the wind, basically. So if you have the wind, you can always if you know the velocity of each molecule 
at, at, at each place at some moment in time, you can determine where exactly the tornado might be actually located. Um, I don't know, but maybe those guys who are predicting the weather, maybe they're doing something similar to this. I don't know. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. They are more detailed in some cases than whatever I presented on the board, but basically along the same line. So thanks very much and good luck.